I'll let you carry on. Oh, is it? Okay. Yes, it's been recorded now, and Steve, you should be able to share, so hopefully. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm okay. not going to say anything now. Can, can everybody see the, 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 whole, the opening slide? It's there. It's there. Uh, Smash it, smash it. Right, well, uh, a formal good evening to one and all, and uh, thank you for, for turning up. It's uh, it's always good when I do talks that people turn up, because it's it's a bit boring otherwise if you're doing it on your own. Um, well, as, uh, as we've heard, I, I'm here to talk about the QRP Club and low power operating. Um, and as you can see from the slide, I am currently the chairman of the GQRP Club. So. Uh, uh, hence, the, there'll be a bit of a sales pitch, but I'll, I'll try not to labour it too much. Um, but um, just for those who don't know me, I, I came into amateur radio from Citizens Band Radio. Like many people in the 1980s, that, that was my introduction to radio. Uh, and I never thought I'd be good enough to be a radio amateur. But uh, over the time, I, I picked up one or two things and uh, uh, ended up uh, as so the chairman of the, the radio society of Great Britain that one point turned it, uh, it was very good, great fun uh, and very educational. So, um, there we go. Um, I was first licensed in 1984. I passed the, the um, what was then the radio amateurs exam in 1983. Uh, couldn't afford to get a license initially, so it was about a year later that I took out the license. And um, uh, yeah, been been licensed ever since, uh, and and continue to enjoy the hobby very very much. So um, let's see if I can get my slides to move on. There we go. Um, that's. The sort of list of questions that I intend to answer in the presentation and um, if you've got questions that aren't listed there we'll, we'll be able to pick those up at the end so pl please keep uh, keep any questions to the end. Um, I've, sent, I've, I've put the thing up to say it's QRP basics because it, it's a huge topic and uh, there's, there's all sorts of strands to it and different things we could talk about. Um, but uh, if you want more information I'll, I'll give you some uh, pointers towards the end and um, uh, one of them is this book called QRP Basics. I didn't write it, I don't get any royalties from it but I can thoroughly recommend it. Uh, you get it from the RSGB bookshop uh, and, and it basically tells you all you need to know. Uh, and I only just realised as I was preparing this talk that, um, that, that the, uh, the, the little transmitter in the middle there on the blue printed circuit board, uh, that's a thing called the Wonner because the that particular version of it is one inch square. So a tiny little thing. Um, it, it'll actually crop up again later on uh, in a version that I uh, I made, but um, I, it, it was only when I, I got this out today, I thought, oh, that's, I didn't realize it was in twice. So uh, I thought I'll draw attention to that in case somebody picks me up on it. Right, so a fairly obvious question. What is QRP? Um, well, anybody that's been amateur radio for any time will know that uh, it's part of the Q code uh, and that's where its origins came from. Originally, QRP with a question mark after it sent in in Morse code meant, can you reduce your power? Uh, and the response QRP meant, yes, I can reduce my power. Well, as amateur radio and radio generally moved on uh, and powers got more, more, um, well, more powerful, um, it, it kind of became a way of operating. Some people opted to stay with low power rather than uh, break out the linear and, uh, and, and crank up the, the, uh, the, the power to full, uh, the all dials to 11. Um, and it, it, so it's just become a way of operating. And uh, as I think everybody learns, but many forget, it's actually good operating practice to keep your power down because the, the um, I think it's the DX code of conduct and another documents tell you that you should only use the minimum amount of power required to make the contact. And uh, the number of times you'll, you'll hear people say, oh, you're a fantastic report, you, you know, S9 plus 99 dB or something. Well, they're clearly using more power than they need to, uh, to make that contact. Um, and if people did reduce the power a little bit, we'd, we'd perhaps get more people on the band and, and it would be less crowded, but that's a bit controversial. 
What is QRP in terms of power? Well, we've, it had all sorts of different definitions, but we've now got an internationally agreed uh, level. And for Morse code, CW, it's five watts output. And for SSB, uh, it's 10 watts PEP. Uh, somebody asked me the year yesterday, what is it for FM? And I had to confess, I didn't know. I, I think it's the same as SSB, but um, uh, I don't think anybody's going to fall out if you're um, so somewhere between the two. Um, we'll go on to see later about how much you can do with that sort of power levels. Um, but some people, that for them, that QRP isn't low enough. And uh, so they operate what we call QRPP, which means less than one watt output. And uh, uh, obviously, if you're less than one watt, you're into milliwatts. And um, uh, it, it, it's fascinating what you can do with uh, with maybe 500 milliwatts. And uh, uh, depending on which band you're on, what the propagation is like, uh, you, you can get some tremendous results. Are you, I, I chose that picture uh, with the watt meter on to, to illustrate this slide because um, uh, it, it's uh, it's a very good watt meter and uh, you can see it, it switches between 20 watts or 5 watts. Um, so depending whether you're doing CW or SSB, it's actually it's a very useful uh, power meter for, for checking things out. Unfortunately, Kanga Products that uh, sold the kit uh, is currently closed the, the between owners. It's, uh, it's, the, the ownership is transferring across. So fingers crossed when it when Kanga reopens, I hope they uh, they start selling this uh, kit again because it's a it's, it is a very good power meter. So the QRP club, uh, not surprisingly, is, is full of people who are keen on uh, operating with low power. And it's got been around for over 40 years now. And uh, the, uh, the, the that clipping in the middle comes from Shortwave magazine in, in 1974. Uh, and that was the first mention of a QRP club uh, where uh, a couple of guys had got together and thought it would be quite good to have a, a QRP club in the UK. And um, the Reverend George Dobbs, G3RJV, uh, volunteered, uh, I put, use the term advisedly, volunteered to, to sort of take the lead and, and make it happen if there were enough people interested. Well, it, it started off with a fairly small number, um, but it grew uh, very quickly in, in to be a, a sizable club. And um, it, it's been running ever since. So uh, in three years time, we'll be celebrating our 50th anniversary. So um, you can expect some, uh, some fun and games uh, in 2023. Uh, it's got a very small committee of four. Uh, we've got chairman, that's me, uh, a treasurer, which is Graham G3 MFJ. Uh, Daphne is our membership secretary, G7 ENA. And uh, Dick G0 BPS is our secretary. Um, so it's, it's you know, it's a small group of people who, uh, who do the, uh, the donkey work, if you like, We've all got our own different uh, uh, strands that we do on. Uh, but there's a, a wider team which aren't committee members, but do lots of good work. And, and I feel guilty singling out a couple, but um, Tony Fishpool, G4 WIF, he runs our website and, and without him, we, we'd be stuck, I think. Uh, and the other guy who's really key to the, uh, what we do is Tex, uh, uh, G1TEX, who used to work for Practical Wireless, but now he's our Sprat editor, our magazine editor, uh, and he's brought some some great skills to play. And uh, we know full colour, and it's all very well produced. And uh, uh, text does a great job. Uh, but we've got a QSL manager, we've got uh, a Valve guy, we've got uh, there was a whole bunch of folk who do things, awards managers, and things like that. So it it, it really is a team effort, and uh, and everybody does a a very good job all volunteers we don't have any staff uh, not like the rsgb or the arrl or anything like that um, uh, and we operate on a not-for-profit basis so uh, everything that we do we recycle and uh, uh, thankfully there's always money in the kitty to to do what we're going to do and i told you there's going to be a sales pitch um the uk membership is six pounds per year um and i always say it's the it's the best six quid you'll ever spend <laughs> but i would say that um for that, you get four magazines a year and, uh, and various other benefits, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about. And the, uh, the photograph there, is, that's George uh, working on an early Sprat. 
the, the, the huge metal thing in front of me is a thing called a typewriter for the younger members of the audience. Uh, they may not know what that uh, one of those is. Uh, but George used to produce the Sprat in his, uh, in his vicarage. Um, and uh, it was all very uh, parish magazine sort of uh, hand to mouth stuff. And uh, so te Texas brought us more into the, uh, the modern age. Um, so what do you get if you remember the QRP club? The, the big picture in the middle is our QSL card. If you work G5LOW, which is the club call sign, uh, you'll get one of these calls, uh, these QSL cards. Uh, and the idea of the QSL card was to give a flavour of all the things that, um, that, that the club does. Um, so the, there's, um, we've got the Sprat magazine, which uh, say comes out four times a year. Uh, we've got the club sales team up top uh, right there. That's uh, Graham and his wife, Pat, and, and um, I think it's George and Richard, uh, are the guys uh, who, who help out at rallies and, uh, and things. If you've ever been to the Telford uh, Havvention, you'll have seen them there. Um, we do construction, so there's some printed circuit boards and things on there. Uh, we have build-a-thons, uh, bottom uh, right the, is the last live build-a-thon we did uh, a couple of years ago before uh, lockdown happened. And of course, we had to have George on there as the founder uh, doing a, uh, a little talk. So um, the club sales I mentioned, we, they, they sell components, they sell books, they sell kits, they've got all pens, and mugs and everything except t-shirts we don't do t-shirts for some strange reason you'd expect a, a club sales thing to do things like that but we don't um we've got a number of awards and trophies that we dish out every year things like the the best log on qrp day uh there's a, a the the big one i think is the uh, uh the, the chelmsley trophy which is for the best log of the year so uh, people keep a tally all the way through the year of what they've worked submit that and the best one gets the, uh, the trophy for that we've got our own little qsl bureau uh, dave up in scotland runs that so if you get one of these qsl cards that will come from him uh, we have a website obviously uh, we've got our own youtube channel if uh, if you want uh, all the presentations from last year's convention are on there uh, and we'll be doing the same again this year we'll put the, uh, the presentations on for all to see uh, and we run conventions. Uh, on the QSL card, there's uh, an example there, uh, top left, um, of uh, when we used to have uh, things like live meetings and, and things, which hopefully we'll get back to again. Uh, always very popular. But last year it was online only. This year is going to be the same. But fingers crossed 2022 will be back in action with a live convention. There's another picture of, uh, I think it was the last one at Rishworth. Uh, um, we, we started off the convention in Rochdale, in, literally in George's church. Um, his church hall was a sort of a, a meeting place and the lectures took place, uh, not from the pulpit, but, but pretty much next to it. And people sat in the pews listening to the, the lectures. It was a bit, a bit odd listening to people building yagis and, uh, and, and circuits in a church, but um, very atmospheric. Uh, after about I don't know, 18 years or something like that at Rochdale, it moved to the Rishwa School, which is this uh, the picture shows. And after 10 years there, uh, the, the, the uh, convention moved to Telford to, to join forces with the Telford Hamvention, uh, or Hamfest, I think they call it, don't they? Um, and uh, we, we've done a couple there. And then, of course, you know, the, we, we were unable to meet last year. We did a virtual convention. We had over 500 people uh, attend that, which was absolutely amazing. And uh, we had speakers from Turkey, um, where else did we have them from the States, Canada, France, um, UK, obviously, Scotland. Uh, so it, it was a real international gathering. And uh, at one point, we actually had people from every IARU region in the same sort of meeting room, which was uh, unbelievable. We certainly couldn't do that with a, 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 a physical thing. So it's, uh, there are advantages to doing these online things. Um, we'll be doing it again this year, if anybody's interested. Uh, it's on the 4th and 5th of September, so Saturday and Sunday, entirely free for members. Uh, so if, you, if you're not a member and you want to uh, attend the convention, uh, you just need to join, that's all. And then you'll get to get a free pass into the, uh, into the convention. And, uh, and the bookings are open now. So uh, that's uh, through Eventbrite, I think, are the, the company that are doing the bookings. 
So what can you do with QRP? Um, there's a question there which I, I, I'm always asked, is there any point using low power? You know, I'm just not going to work anything. Well, the answer is yes, it is. Uh, I, I saw as people were coming in, there's quite a number of foundation license holders. Uh, and by default, they are a QRP operator because um, uh, they're limited to 10 watts. So certainly within the SSB uh, power range. And uh, I've got a, a, a guy who I put through the, uh, uh, the foundation license. He lives about I don't know, 10 miles away from me. Uh, and he quite regularly rings me up and tells me what he's been working. And uh, it literally is all over the place. You know, I've been working hard and uh, he, he will ring me up and tell me he's just been having a chat with somebody in Thailand or something like that. And uh, uh, he, he was running a, a, an FT817 uh, for, for quite a long time. So uh, any accusations that he was running too much power, uh, I can assure you he wasn't. He's, he's a genuine uh, QRP operator. Now, a lot of people think, well, how can that be? You know, I, I, I need 100 watts, I need 400 watts, I need a kilowatt because I've got lossy coax or whatever. Uh, and the sort of science that lies behind this is to do with the S points. And uh, this is you know, a fairly reasonable um, analysis that all the rig manufacturers generally work to this calibration of that one S point is six decibels. So if you increase your power by six decibels, you will increase your signal report by one S point, roughly. Um, so going the other way, if you were to reduce your power, you'd have to reduce it uh, by a quarter. So half it and half it again to take six dB away. So I've got this little chart just to show that what, how that might work. So if you're working somewhere and they're operating with 400 watts and, and the signal report is S9 plus six dB, you can see why I picked 6 dB there, because it's easy for the maths. Um, and they halve the power and halve it again, so it's down to 100 watts. They would then be S9. And if they halve it and halve it again, it's 25 watts, they'll be S8. Uh, and you can see, once you get down into the QRP levels, you're still S6, S5 with 750 milliwatts. And um, it, it, it's amazing. When people try that, it actually works. Now, the only time you come unstuck with that is if the noise level is at S7, uh, because as soon as you get to QRP, you're then below the noise and, and then it gets tricky to work. And, and uh, that, that's, you know, that, that's a, a problem with modern life, unfortunately. Um, I, I'm guessing you guys up in North Wales may not suffer quite so much, but certainly here in the city centre in Bath, uh, my, my noise level is usually about eight or nine on 80 metres. So um, unless there's a really good signal, I, I just can't hear them. And uh, I complained about the VDSL and Ofcom agreed that there was a problem, but didn't do anything about it. So that's what you can, that's the sort of science as to why you can work things with low power, that you, you really don't need those big, uh, big, big numbers. What does that mean in terms of contact? Well, uh, uh, you'll notice throughout this presentation, there's a number of cartoons by John Worthington, um, who was either G3COI or GW3COI, depending uh, where he was in his, uh, his lifetime. He's uh, passed away now, and uh, very sadly, but uh, he, he did some cracking cartoons. Uh, and, and I thought this one depicted what people think about QRP. You know, it's okay for you know, cross-town chats and things like that, but it's no good for DX. And uh, uh, that's not been my experience. Um, I've got QSL cards from New Zealand, Australia, States, Canada, uh, all over Europe, uh, all with QRP. Uh, uh, and the, the, the ZL one that I'm really proud of, um, I was actually on holiday in France, and I'd been working lots of German stations, and uh, I, I so I went on one morning, there was not much happening. I put a call out. I thought, right, one more and then I'm packing up. And I put this call out and the station came back. And I thought, oh, another DL. Uh, and he came back, no, ZL. <laughs> I nearly fell off my chair. Um, and it was genuine contact. He sent me a direct QSL card about a week later. Uh, and uh, and it was ZL2PW, if member so, the memory serves me right. Absolutely brilliant to be in the right place at the right time. Uh, and that was with my 817. Uh, so three or four watts into a dipole, and uh, and there it was. So my experience is you can work uh, lots of DX uh, if you're in the right place at the right time. 
was it last year or the year before? The first lockdown, we had uh, a, a couple of QSO parties. The RSGB organised the uh, what they called the Hope QSO parties, uh, and they were very good. They were just ninety minutes a day, different times of day, different modes each day, and uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed taking part. And uh, the the club call rotated around, and different people operated on different days, and. Um, out of 500 entries that took part in that QSO party, the GQRP club came in the top 50. I think we were 42 or something like that, um, which showed that the QRP club could hold its own against some much higher powered stations. And when we looked closely, the individual scores of the top 10, three of them were single QRP operators. Uh, and Tim G4ARI, I think it was, he came second overall, um, uh, uh, where other people were using uh, full legal power and all the rest of it. Tim was up there with five, 10 watts uh, and, and came second overall. So it does show that if you know, you're in the right place, the right time, and, and you, you've got a bit of skill, you can, you, you can, you can run with the big boys. I've got some examples to, to sort of show that, uh, how that works as well. Um, the first one is George, GM30XX, uh, very famous qrp -er, sadly no longer with us. Um, uh, and I have to thank George for, when I first got involved, he gave me some advice on antennas that uh, I, I found invaluable and uh, uh, stayed with me uh, all these years. Uh, but before he passed away, George had over 300 countries confirmed with using homebrew rigs, with all with one watt or less output. So George was very keen on milliwatting. Uh, he normally operated between 500 and sort of 800 milliwatts. Uh, and if he, was, if he was feeling like really cranking the power up, he'd go all the way to one watt. Um, and, and the one on the, the circuit there is a typical example of George's transmitters, you know, a couple of transistors and a crystal, that was it. Uh, no, nothing more complicated than that. Uh, and that was called the OXO. And, uh, uh, there's literally been hundreds, if not thousands, of these made. Uh, and when we were running our intermediate courses in Bath, we actually made some of these kits up, and uh, it was a good exercise to build, uh, learn about oscillators, learn about key in transistors, and uh, and just generally component identification. Uh, and it didn't cost very much. It was uh, it was a great little uh, great little circuit. So that was George. George also had some very uh, significant uh, achievements with microwaves, which again, QRP, but in a, a different way. Uh, he, he was a very clever guy, was George. No, um, I didn't pick this one deliberately. Carol's been in this presentation uh, for, for some time. Um, but I think Carl is the epitome of what can be done if you are dedicated with QRP. Um, he's been the winner of our Chelmsley Trophy, the annual uh, award, uh, no, no fewer than three times. Uh, and he's a very dedicated operator. And you can see there, that was in 2019 when the sunspots were virtually non-existent. The propagation really wasn't great. Uh, and lots of people were, were moaning about the fact they couldn't make contacts. Well, Carl got on there and he, he made over 1400 contacts. And uh, about two thirds were on Morse uh, and a third on, uh, on SSB. Uh, 120 of them were two way QRP. In other words, both stations were, were operating with, with low power. Um, so yeah, quite a, a, an achievement there. And, uh, and Carl's actually gonna be one of our speakers at the, uh, at the convention this year to uh, hopefully share his secrets about uh, uh, how he does this. Uh, it's got quite a collection of Morse keys at the back there, you can see. Uh, but uh, yeah, cracking operator. He uses one of these, um, uh, is it a Zygu G90? Uh, Chinese transceivers at the moment. And uh, he's, he's got some other QRP radios as well, but that's, uh, that's his weapon of choice at the moment. So why would you go QRP? Um, the first one, as I said earlier, foundation licenses, they've got no choice. They're, they're limited to QRP and uh, uh, again, a lot of people say, oh, they're not really operating QRP. They all got linears and they're, they're using big rigs. And I'm sure some of them are. Um, but in the same way that there are G4s and G3s out there that are running a kilowatt, it's, it's, it's no more wrong for a foundation license to break the law than it is a full license holder. You know, we should all stick to our license uh, parameters. Um, but so I know many foundation license holders who, uh, who will never 
uh, transgress that that's they're just not that kind of people uh, and I had a very uh, a, a friend who lived just the other side of town um, he had an intermediate license but when he got his intermediate license he was limited to 10 watts and when the license was up to 50 watts he never increased his power he, he kept it at 10 watts uh, on the basis that he was working the world so why did he need to increase it and uh, if if you uh, if you feel inclined if you go on to qrz.com and look up 2E0BGD, Bravo Golf Delta. Uh, Brian's got a picture of him in the shack there with his QSL cards behind him, and he, he really did work the DX. Sadly passed away, and uh, he's no longer around, but uh, but a really nice guy and, and a, a great example of what you can achieve with QRP. One of the reasons for going QRP is portability. People like to go up mountains and, and operate from, uh, from summits, and you certainly couldn't do that with uh, a generator and uh, a linear amplifier and uh, you know all the things you need for a high power station. It, you just couldn't do it you, unless you've got an army of people to help you out or a helicopter to drop it on the summit. Um, so QRP operating from hilltops is very popular, and uh, you know a couple of batteries and uh, maybe a solar panel, and you, you can operate all day from uh, uh, from a, from what you can carry in a rucksack quite easily. Uh, so that, that's a thing. People do that. I think this was the Hereford group uh, that were operating in a two meter contest, uh, the, the picture. But anyway, it, it, they're operating low power and, uh, and, and thoroughly enjoying it. It was something I used to do. Um, I, I used to carry radio, uh, two meter radio up to the top of the hills in the Lake District and uh, operate from there. But uh, uh, my, my knees don't do that anymore. Um, Low cost, yeah. I, I mentioned earlier when I came into the hobby, um, the, the the cost of equipment was very off-putting. Um, uh, the uh, uh, the thought of, of spending something like a couple of months' salary on a radio was just not there, and, and credit wasn't quite so easy to get in those days. So, I found out that you can actually build your own radios, and uh, a QRP project set me off uh, on that. And uh, by the time I'd passed the Morse test, I actually had a working transceiver that I could use, which was uh, which was great. And it hadn't cost very much and, and I'd learned a lot in, in building it. Hot topic is these EMF risk assessments. And uh, obviously, if you're operating QRP, uh, you're going to have to try very hard to get above the 10 watt EIRP threshold. Um, using a beam such as that, in the picture might get you up there but with a basic hf set um dipole or a, a vertical or something like that it's highly highly unlikely that you're gonna have to worry about uh um, being above the uh the uh, ICNURP, uh exposure limits so that's you know I, I know a number of people who said they're going to go qrp because of that and obviously with lower uh, power, you've got a lower EMC risk. You're, you're not going to wipe out the neighbor's TVs if you're using lower power. Uh, the converse is true. If you start trying to run a 400 watt amplifier in a suburban environment, there's a pretty good chance you will wipe out your neighbor's TV. Or, or as uh, a, a neighbor that I had, um, he, he used to operate in the middle of the night and his neighbor's uh, fluorescent light in the kitchen used to start flashing. But uh, um, that, that clearly wasn't uh, wasn't a, a good EMC uh, sort of uh, example. But probably the, the biggest reason that people go for QRP is the challenge um, that I quite often hear newcomers that uh, they get on the air, they get a radio, and they you know, within a few weekends they've worked the world. And um, the, the the next thing is, well, I wonder if I can do it again with less power, and they start cranking the power back and. Uh, uh, the number of people, they, they work hard to get their full license and you know, have access to 400 watts. And not long after that, they're joining the QRP club because they want more of a challenge. So um, I'll, I'll speak more about the, the, you know, what you can achieve and what you, the rewards that are available uh, later on. But, uh, but having that challenge of doing it all with, uh, uh, with, with low power is, uh, is, is quite a draw for a lot of people. Are there any downsides? Well, yes, there are. Uh, with all these things, there's pluses and minuses. And, and as John's cartoon shows, miniature rigs um, can, can be problems. I've certainly put them down and for, couldn't find them again. They, they can get buried. Um, there are other frustrations, though. Um, uh, if you're waiting to work a station and you can hear everybody's calling, there's no escaping it. If you're QRP and other people are not, you're not going to get heard above the crowd. That's 
you know, you've just got to accept that. And you may have to wait some time uh, before you can get your call in and, and work that station. Uh, and an example of that, I was listening one day, uh, I was working in the shack and I had the radio on and there was a, a special event station in New, in Australia, one of the uh, the national parks. And it was it was like a zoo, you know, there were, there were people calling and talking over each other as these things happen. And then he stopped, paused at one point and said, are there any QRP stations out there? And there was silence. So I dashed across to the other side of the shack picked the microphone up and called him uh, and, and we made the contact. So it just showed that if you were uh, patient, um, you, you can do it. And that was again, FT817, five watts, I think, running off the power supply uh, and the dipole on the back of the house. So uh, um, it, it, again, the propagation gods were with us on that day. I, I, I thought it'd be wrong not to include this you do get jibes if you commit to going qrp and you tell anybody that's what you're doing uh, one of the first things you'll hear is this retort oh life's too short for qrp and um, the, the the idea is that you, you can't afford to sit and wait to make these contacts you've got to get on with it um well i mentioned earlier that these people take this up for a challenge and and i think their view is life is too long for high power um, that you, you know, you, if you've worked the world and, and got your DXCC uh, with 100 watts or whatever, um, what are you going to do for the rest of the time then? What comes next? Well, doing it with QRP, it may take longer, but um, you know, life's plenty long enough for QRP. I, I can testify to that. Now, Simon mentioned earlier about home brew, and uh, the, again, a question we get asked is, do people still build radios? You know, we get all these fancy kit that you can go and buy now, and they're you know, much, much cheaper than they used to be. Um, so do, do people still do it? Well, the answer is a resounding yes. There's, oh, there's evidence there of uh, a bunch of folk building uh, uh, at the Build-a-thon. Uh, I think we had 16 people in that uh, particular uh, thing and uh, all building the, the variable frequency oscillators, uh, which was great fun because um, what we hadn't told people was that we'd mixed up some of the components, so some of them drifted more than others. Uh, and, and after we'd done the build a thon, we had a thing called the drift a thon to see who had the one that drifted the least. And uh, that, that was good fun having the, the leaderboard up to, uh, to see who got the, uh, the driftiest VFO. Uh, we gave them uh, good capacitors as well, so they could swap them over afterwards. But um, but yeah, it's good fun. Um, I mentioned earlier that we've got the club sales team, and uh, over the last fifteen years, uh, Graham's been keeping a tally of what he sold, uh, as he's the treasurer. You'd imagine he would do that. Uh, but over a thousand kits, fourteen hundred plus project books, um, nearly six thousand crystals. It is now. Uh, 12,000 transistors and ICs, 60,000 toroidal cores. So the fact that Graham's selling all these things, you know, somebody somewhere is making radios. And uh, I, well, again, the, the, the evidence that uh, you've got in front of you is pe people do do this. And uh, uh, the, the, um, I get a lot of enjoyment out of it and, uh, and, and, and lots of learning because you, you about other people but i learn by mistakes and uh, uh when you, i've made a few and uh, you tend not to make them the second time well most of them anyway but uh, yeah people do still build radios um this is a bit like the old blue peter thing here's one i made earlier uh this is the one i referred to at the beginning that this is my version of the one uh it's actually two and a half inches by two and a half inches so it's the two and a half if you like um but the, the basic transmitter probably is about a one inch square still, uh, but I've added my own low pass filter on the side of it. So that, that takes up nearly half the board. Um, very, very simple circuit. It's got an oscillator and two uh, transistors for, as a power amplifier, and then another transistor to key the whole thing on and off. And that's about it really. Um, and it produces uh, three, maybe four watts if you're lucky. And uh, uh, that one's on five megahertz, and uh, it's, it's a cracking little transmitter, and uh, yeah, great, great fun to build, and, uh, and works very, very well. I think I actually made a mistake on the diagram there, and the PA transistors were the wrong way around. Um, 
that uh, it, I needed to uh, to do an amendment to that. But um, they were correct on the board, uh, but not in the diagram. This is another way of building uh, the, the previous one. I built the uh, the printed circuit board from that, made it from scratch. This one, this is a kit, uh, or it's two kits actually, from Walford Electronics. Um, Tim Walford. I won't say he's a neighbour of mine, but he's in Somerset, just a, a, a about an hour's drive uh, from here. And uh, and he, he used to be a farmer, he's retired now, but uh, he used to farm by day and make radio kits in the evenings and, we, uh, and very, very good kits they are too. Um, I say this one's two kits. The, uh, the front end uh, is the receiver. It's a super heterodyne receiver. I think that one's on 20 metres. And... Um, you could just build the receiver uh, and it works very, very well. We, we did a build-a-thon uh, and about 20 people built those uh, in, in a day. Uh, take your time, it, it, it's really good and it works very, very well. And then the, the back half is the transmitter that goes with it. So uh, it uses a lot of the circuitry in the receiver as part of the transmitter as well. So uh, there ain't a lot on the transmitter board. Uh, it's the power amplifier, low pass filter, a couple of relays and, uh, and the mic amp. Um, and uh, that produces about, I think it's three or four watts uh, on 20 metres, a little bit more if you build it for 40 metres. Um, and I, I got one of these and uh, I think the last count I was up to about 30 countries with it. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's a cracking little thing. And the cost for that, less than £100, I think they're about £80 for the two kits together. Uh, or you can buy one, build that and then buy, buy the other one later if you want to spread the cost. So uh, very, very reasonable. I've kept Kanga uh, kits on the presentation in the hope that they are going to reopen soon. They, they, should, be, uh, they should be reopening fairly soon, hopefully. Um, but Kanga made, made a sort of decision a couple of years ago, maybe 18 months, to, to move more towards surface mount construction. For those who uh, are not familiar with it, this is where the, the components are soldered on, on the same side of the printed circuit board as the tracks. And um, uh, there are three examples here. The bottom one is a dummy load. Uh, and if you're doing this for the first time, I thoroughly recommend that as a, as a beginner's kit. Um, the, the components are quite large for surface mount devices uh, and, and most of them are the same value. So you can't get them mixed up. Um, and it does provide a very good 20 watt dummy load at the end of the day, which uh, works really well. Built in BNC connector. So it's, it's, it's a, sort of a, a complete project. Uh, makes, makes for a good project to, at a club that where you can sort of get together and build yourselves. The middle one is a, a 40 meter direct conversion receiver, uh, and it's deliberately made bigger than it needs to be uh, because it, it's intended for beginners who are doing this surface mount stuff for the first time. And uh, uh, you can see all the little components there and uh, the, the, how small they are compared with uh, uh, some of the, the, the tuning cans, which were 10 mil across, I think. So the, the, some of these components really are quite tiny. And then the top one, uh, that whole printed circuit board is about three inches long, something like that. Um, and that is quite densely packed. But I built that with an ordinary soldering iron and, uh, and, and no magnifying glass or anything, just a pair of tweezers and uh, uh, a lot of patience. But uh, that's an SDR receiver for 80 meters, I think it is. Um, and again, works really well. So Kanga, so I don't, when they reopen, if they carry on that route, I don't know, but uh, they, they did a, a good range of kits uh, and, uh, and moving more towards surface mount components. QRP Labs are based in Turkey. Uh, Hans Summers is the, uh, the guy who's the proprietor. And um, uh, his absolute claim to fame, I think, is this QCX transceiver. Um, the one the, with the printed circuit board on its own that's not in a case was the one he designed for our Youngsters on the Air event in 2017. And uh, we asked him if he could come up with a simple kit that youngsters could build. Uh, and, and this is what he, he, he came back with. Um, and it's a, a microprocessor controlled CW transceiver that's got well, everything built in it, it's easier to say what it doesn't do. Um, it, it's got its own test equipment built in there. It's got a keyer. Uh, it decodes the Morse onto the screen. Crikey, it does all sorts. Um, and he sells those for about 
40 quid or something like that. Um, unbelievable. I ran that alongside my Yesu 817. Uh, and I couldn't tell the difference in terms of receive quality. It, it was that good. So uh, very impressed with that. Uh, and I think at last count, he'd sold something like 12,000 of those kits. So again, back to my thing, do people still go radios? Yes, they do. He's now got two other versions of it. One is the QCX Plus, which is the black box at the top right-hand corner. Um, and it, it, it's a sort of a, a bigger version of the original. It's, it's easier to build because it's not so cramped. Um, and it's got a nice uh, die cast box and everything. It looks, uh, looks pretty neat. And then the one at the bottom is his latest edition is the QCX Mini, which is tiny, as you can see. It's not a giant hand there. It's, uh, it's a, an ordinary person's hand. Uh, so you really could stick that in your pocket and go up a mountain with it. And uh, it produces about three watts of, uh, of, of Morse. And it's got all the same features as the original. It's got a decoder in it. It's got... Um, uh, you can memory keyer, uh, you can set it up as a beacon. It can, I'll say it's, uh, it's it's probably easier to tell you what it doesn't do, like make the tea, uh, than what it does do because it's it's got so many um, features. So Hans is good. He's got all sorts of other kits as well, uh, and uh, you can explore his website and, uh, and see what he's got. But uh, uh, as you can see, they they look pretty nice. Now this is one that not that many people know about. I think there was an article in Radcom not that long ago about how about the experience of putting one of these together. Um, it involves very little, if any, soldering. It's more of an assembly job than a, a, a soldering job because the printed circuit board comes pre-populated, and then you get, as you can see, the the, the case and the reader, the digi dial, and all, all the various bits and pieces. So it's a, it's an assembly job. And what you end up with is a, a 10 watts multiband SSB transceiver. Uh, and you can see it works on all the HF bands. Um, and it's microprocessor controlled, so it doesn't drift. Um, it, it's you know, a super head receiver, big crystal filter in the middle. You can see on the printed circuit board. And that kit is currently priced at $200, including delivery, uh, believe it or not. So. Um, I don't know what the dollar exchange rate is at the moment, but certainly around about £200, you can have an all-band QRP transceiver uh, up and working. And uh, one of our intermediate guys built one uh, as his project, but we, we ruled it out because there wasn't enough soldering. Uh, but he, he was quite happy to build something else, and uh, he, he, he was working the world on, uh, on, on with this um, uh, he, he thoroughly enjoyed his, uh, his uh, it's called a micro bitx or new bitx um, um, the, uh, the the original one was it's called a bitx it's bi-directional transceiver um, but uh, this is the version six i think so if you go to the hf signals website you'll, you'll see it there it's about so about two hundred dollars oh another advert uh, GQRP Club sells kits. Uh, we've only got many. We've got a transmitter, a receiver, an ATU, uh, and they're called the Sudden. Uh, this, the black thing at the top, that's the, uh, the ATU or the AMU. Um, the one in the middle of the, the green printed circuit board is a project we've been working on. Uh, it's not yet available, but uh, that's a, a, a digital VFO. Uh, it's got two VFOs and it's got a Kia built in. Um, and, uh, and the idea is that that's going to allow you to link the receiver and the transmitter together to make a transceiver. Um, and I've currently got one running on 20 meters and uh, with the two kits. Uh, and that works, uh, works incredibly well. I was listening to a guy in Brazil on it uh, the other night. And um, the, uh, the only bit I haven't got working yet is the S meter, but I need to spend a little bit more time with that. But uh, uh, I need to thank Kevin, the, uh, uh, M0KHZ, who's been helping us with the design work on that. He's, uh, he's done a fantastic job. So hopefully those will be available later in the year. Right, for those who don't do homebrew, um, are there any commercial QRP rigs? Well, for a long time, there wasn't that many. Um, the FT817, the Yesu was about the only one. Uh, there used to be an old trio, the TS120, which was, uh, which was a nice little thing. And, and Icon briefly had one, which I can't remember its number, 703, I think, something like that. Um, but if you commercial radio for QRP, you basically you had to um, buy a QRO rig and turn the power down. But that's not the case anymore. Um, this is a sample of what's available. 
there's the Yesu at the top there. That's about 600 quid if you uh, if you want to take a, a plunge with one of those. The one next to it is the Zygu G90, which is an SDR based uh, transceiver. Um, I think they are about 400 pounds. Uh, it does Morse, uh, it does SSB and all the other digi modes and all the rest of it. Um, so in the middle, though, we've got uh, a new kid on the block, which is the, the Lab Gear 599 Discovery, uh, which Waters and Stanton have just um, imported. Uh, it's about 600 quid. It's tiny. It's about half an inch thick, um, less than the size of a, a paperback book. Uh, and that produces about 10 watts of SSB with an SDR receiver. It's a, it's a fantastic thing. Uh, and it's sort of un unique selling point is it's waterproof. So if you go up on the hills with it uh, and it starts raining, you don't need to worry about the radio. It's, it's entirely encased and, uh, and, and totally waterproof. In fact, Pete Waters did a video where he, he, he literally put it out on the patio and put his watering can over it and it still worked. So I think his heart was in his mouth when he was doing it, but it, it certainly worked. Um, I think they sell at about £800, something like that. So it's so the price is, is getting up a bit. Um, but then we've got the two other, which are the sort of uh, the, the, the sort of the Rolls Royce and the uh, the Mercedes, I guess. Uh, you decide which is which. But one's the Alicraft KX3, uh, and the other is the Icom 705. Uh, so the latest generation of QRP commercial radios. You won't get much change out of fifteen hundred quid for each one of those. The, the, if, you, if you get all the accessories, the battery pack, and, and you know. The, you, you know if you bought both of them, you certainly need more than £3,000, which is uh, quite an investment for a QRP station. They are very good radios, don't get me wrong, but uh, uh, they won't be joining the G0FUW shack for, uh, for any time soon, that's for sure. But if you want a commercial QRP rig, they are available. Yeah, I was having, actually having a chat with somebody yesterday about this, and uh, he said, well, it's all right, this QRP, but you're all using CW, aren't you? And I said, well, no, we're not actually. Um, there's quite a lot of SSB QRP work going on. Um, and if you want to know more about that, um, we've got a video on our YouTube channel by uh, Pete, N6QW, from our convention last year. And he did a talk called Simple SSB. Uh, and he walked through a design of a, a, a complete uh, SSB transceiver. And uh, there's a website that's linked from the talk where you've got all the circuits and the details of how to build it. And I, I built one and, and it's a fantastic little radio. Didn't cost very much, didn't take that long to build, uh, uh, but great fun to use. Puts about three watts out, something like that on a single band, digital controlled. Um, as you can see on the, the picture there, you've got the, the GVFO these days, it's almost universal. A lot of people use QRP a lot with data uh, and, and the, the, the new sort of thing, in fact, is it the sixth anniversary this, this week or next week, uh, FT8 uh, and FT4 are the sort of latest uh, versions of this uh, sort of, uh, digital modes. Um, again, there's a talk on our web, on our YouTube channel by Anthony K8ZT. Um, Anthony says that FT8 changed his world. He, he was struggling to, uh, work any different countries and, and FTA opened up a whole new uh, uh, world to him and uh, I think even during the talk he was actually working stations uh, on, on FTA which was, uh, was very exciting times um, and I've had a go at it and it's amazing what, what it can do I, I was genuinely surprised as to how far you can get with that um, there are those who say it's not real radio um, it's not everybody's cup of tea um, but you are transmitting RF and you are exchanging uh, signal reports and, and things with other stations. So uh, the fact that it's not on a key or a mic, my view is uh, there's all sorts of different ways of using radios and that's one of them. So I, I, I think it's got its place. And the other point to make, again, a lot of people think that QRP is only about uh, the, the high frequency bands. Uh, there's a lot of QRP going on in VHF. So uh, every year, practical wireless run contests for two meters and four meters. The four meter one's coming up in September. Um, and the RSGB, uh, virtually every contest they do has a low power section. So you can enter the contest and, and tag yourself as a low power station. I put the 50 meg contest up. There used to be a thing called the 50 meg backpackers, which was only for low power stations. 
I used to thoroughly enjoy working that, uh, and then this, they merged it in with the, uh, the, 50, the bigger 50 meg contest, and uh, it's just a low power section within it. But, uh, but you know, it's amazing what you can do. I, I <laughs> story I, I often trot out. Uh, I was working on 50 megs with a, a loop antenna, and I'd been getting five and nine reports you know, all over the place. And then I worked a station in Croatia who gave me something like three and three. Uh, and I thought, oh, he's been a bit mean. Uh, turned round and my loop was lying on the floor. The mast had fallen down and the loop was on the floor. And I was still getting a three and three report of 50 megs with three watts, which was, uh, was absolutely amazing. My first contact on 50 megs was actually with 500 milliwatts into Italy. Um, if the propagation's open on, on six metres, you do not need much power, I'll tell you that. So it's not all about CW, there's lots of other things you can do as well. That's a bit of a rhetorical question. Does good operating skills help? Absolutely they do. Um, you, can, uh, you can sit there all day and call CQ on a dead band and you ain't gonna work anybody. So you need to be good at listening, finding out what's going on, which bands are open, which ones are closed. Um, who's working who uh, uh, and if you've got some knowledge of the propagation how it works you know you, you can sort of be in the right place at the right time by choice rather than an accident each band has a center of activity for qrp so if you go to the band plans have a look at that um, you can hang about around those centers of activity and you'll hear other qrp stations if that's what you want to do um, Likewise, there's no point looking for CW stations in the SSB section and vice versa. The band plans uh, are there for a reason to, to get us organised. And, uh, and by using that sort of knowledge, you can increase your chances of making contacts. One of my favourite ways of making contacts is what they call tail ending. In other words, you listen to a contact and as soon as the guy finishes, he says seven threes, you call whichever one of the things you, you're interested in working or, you know, specifically. So, um, you know, you wait till it's finished and then you call one of the stations and the chances are they're going to answer because they're, they're already on the frequency. Uh, the fact that you've called them with their call sign makes them feel a bit obliged to reply. <laughs> um, and that can sort of start off things, uh, you know, to, that will move on. Sometimes you get to work both stations. So it's a, it's a good way of, uh, of getting in there. And uh, it also improves your listening skills if, you, if you've got to be patient and wait to the end of the contact. If you want to bump up your country scores with QRP, go in a contest. Um, it's amazing how contesters will hear a QRP station when they wouldn't necessarily hear them if the contest wasn't working uh, because they're desperate to get the points and get the, the stations in the log. So if you can hear somebody calling CQ test, CQ test, CQ test, and nobody's calling them, give them a call. Your chances are they'll, they'll bite your hand off to, uh, to, to get the point in the, in the log book. Uh, and I did that in one of the contests and uh, I was working stations all over the place and um, uh, it was great fun just ticking them off. Uh, they give you the obligatory five and nine and the serial number and uh, you know, it, it doesn't mean very much, but you know you've made the, uh, made the contact. Now again, earlier I talked about the challenges. What sort of rewards can you get for, for working QRP stations? Well, there's a whole raft of them. Uh, for those who are on um, the, the, the call now and, and, and have got a foundation license, I would absolutely commend the RSGB Foundation Award to you. Um, it works on three levels, bronze, silver and gold. I think there might even be a platinum, I can't remember now. But basically, the more stations you work, the higher up the, the, the medal uh, podium you go. Um, but you're not in a competition with anybody else. It's just your time. So if you, if you work uh, I think it's 40 stations, you'll get the bronze. Oh, I can't, can't remember the numbers, but the more you work, the, 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 the higher up the award you go. And it, it gives you something to aim for. And I think that's uh, it's important once you've got your license that you actually get on the air and, and do something. And that's a fantastic way of, uh, of, of getting going and getting some experience on the bands. The big one that everybody goes for, or not say everybody, a lot of people chase, is the ARRL's DXCC. And that's where you work 100 different countries and, and have them confirmed. Uh, and to do that with QRP is quite an achievement. And uh, I, I've set myself the goal uh, in the current sunspot cycle, cycle 25, to, uh, to achieve that. 
to work 100 countries with QRP within one solar cycle, which um, um, it, it, as we're on the up, I'm hoping to start ramping my score up. It's a bit slow at the moment, but we'll, we'll, hopefully though, things will get better over the next few years. The club itself, the GQRP club, we've got our own awards. And um, uh, if you work, I think the basic award is 10 countries with QRP, you get a little certificate. And then for every 10 countries after that, you get a, a, an increment. Uh, we also give awards for working other QRP club members. And uh, uh, again, the more you work, the, the more uh, stickers you get on your, uh, on your certificate. Uh, Two-way QRP, again, different kind of award and uh, much harder to do because both ends have got to have uh, good ears and, uh, and good setups. And the one which is, uh, is most sought after is the QRP Master. And uh, for that, you have to have a mix of all the others. And, and again, I forget the numbers, but it's something like 20 countries, 60 members, uh, so many two-way QRP. And in the 40 odd year history of the club, we've only issued 150 of those. So you can see it's uh, it's not easy to do. Um, and uh, uh, one day I hope I will be on that list, but uh, I'm some way off it yet. What I have got is this certificate you see on the slide, uh, which is from the, uh, the QRP uh, Amateur Radio Club International, which is based in America. They produce a magazine called QRP Quarterly. And they also have this award for a thousand miles per watt. And the idea is you divide the distance that you've worked by the power that you're running. Uh, and if that comes to more than a thousand, then you get a certificate. Uh, and there was mine, 1,056 miles per watt it came out at. Uh, I was on CW with three watts uh, and I worked KZ1H in Beverly, Massachusetts. And, uh, and, and that was the, uh, that's my certificate. So uh, um, it means nothing to anybody else, but I was proud of it. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's nice to hang on the wall. So uh, a little bit of a summary of where we've been and what we've covered. Um, hopefully you've seen that QRP is viable and it's good fun. Uh, there are all sorts of reasons for going QRP, whether it's cost or portability or whatever floats your boat. Uh, you can do it with homebrew gear or commercial gear, entirely up to you. Uh, uh, you can be on CW, SSB or data. The rewards for, for those uh, uh, that make the achievements uh, and you're not going to upset people with um, radiation risks or, or EMC, hopefully. And if you choose to join the QRP club, best six quid you'll ever spend. We've got a long history. We've got a stable membership of about 4,000, which um, when you think the RSGB has got 20,000, that's, um, that's quite a slice of, uh, of, of that to, to, for a little club like the QRP club. Uh, there's all sorts of help available. One of the biggest benefits of being in the QRP club is that people are so friendly and helpful. If you pose a question, you will get lots of answers and lots of help. Absolutely. That happened to me when I came into the hobby and, uh, and it continues to this day. And there's all sorts of benefits from being a member that we've, we've talked about, not least the access to club sales. So I think, yes, that's my last slide. And the last one of, uh, uh, of John's uh, cartoons shows that uh, the benefits of having a, a portable QRP rig, that if you do get shipwrecked on a, a desert island, uh, a, a bit of a, a battery or solar power, a bit of wire and you're on the air calling SOS. <laughs> Um, if you want more information, uh, there's a couple of books I recommend. Um, first one I mentioned earlier, it's QRP Basics from the RSGB. Um, it's just gone through a, a, an update. I think it's in its second edition now. But, uh, it's still a very good book. Uh, and the other one is the American sort of equivalent of it uh, called Low Power Communication. Uh, again, you can get that from the RSGB or the ARRL bookstores. I think you can get both through Amazon as well for that matter. Um, and there's a whole raft of other things you can, uh, you can do. Uh, what I will do is I'll send a, a list of information to Simon and uh, you can circulate it to, to the club members. Uh, that's got kit suppliers, it's got books, it's got websites and all sorts of other things on there. So with that, um, oh, I should say, if you've got any questions that... Uh, So, 
So if I stop sharing, I'll put that back to the chairman uh, to take us to the, uh, see if there's any questions. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, Steve. That was very, very interesting, very well presented. And uh, yes, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, I was looking around the shack here, actually. And I'm thinking to myself, I've got an Ameritron AL811 amplifier here. And I was thinking, what the hell did I buy it for? It's been <laughs> here. It has actually been here, I know, for 14 years. I've never used it. So that's a nice, handy little bit of space that might go missing one day. But there we are. <laughs> right, gentlemen, has anybody got any questions for Steve? Can I? Can I jump in? Uh, this, uh, uh, Stu GW zero eight here. Um, Steve, uh, listening to that reminded me of a a QSO I had. Oh, it been several years ago now, and I've managed to actually dig it out from my logbook, and it was on seventeen meters with a uh, an operator in Japan, and his call sign is Japan Quebec. Juliet Quebec 2 UOZ Uniform Oscar Zulu and you can actually pull up his QRZ.com um, page. Now I heard this signal calling CQ and he was really really weak so I gave him a call and it took um, several attempts to get his uh, call sign in the log correct and then uh, to get the, the signal report so once I'd got his uh, call sign confirmed and his signal report, uh, next time I went back, he shot right up in, uh, in strength. I mean, not, not like super strong. Um, and this guy, I can't remember his name now. I have got, it, I have got the QRZ page up. Um, but his way of operating is uh, he will call CQ at 500 milliwatts. Um, and then... Once he's got your call sign confirmed and then the signal report, which constitutes a valid uh, QSO, he might then uh, go QRO up to five watts, which is what he did. So he then, he then explained what he was doing. But if you look on his QRZ page, this is how he operates. He'll call CQ at 500 milliwatts, right? And then he will uh, basically work anybody at QRP stroke P, um, and and then it just builds up all these all these contacts. Uh, but it was um, it was quite amazing, really, 500 milliwatts. Um, and then he, as I say, he went up to five watts just to sort of you know get, give a few sort of details. But he 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 purposefully works uh, the first part of the QSO on 500 milliwatts, and then it's a a genuine QRP stroke P um, contact. So it's quite interesting if you look on his uh, QLZ.com uh, page and he explains uh, basically how he works. That's what he does all the time. Um, and you give, uh, give us the call again, Stu. Juliet Quebec Quarter. Juliet Quebec 2. Uh -huh. Uniform Oscar Zulu. Super. Oh, he, I'll, I'll take a look at that. He's Aki, A-K-I, uh, in Nagoya. Uh, city. I, I managed to search through my log and actually found it, which, uh, which I was quite yeah. pleased about, because I remember that, something you, you kind of don't forget. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and interestingly, on his page, he does say, this page is to praise DX stations who work me for their yeah. excellent ears, skills and patience. So you do have to remember that a lot of the work is done from, uh, from the other end, but it's, uh, it, was, it was fun working him. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. Well, one of the the um, QRP blocks we talk, well, I talk to most often is of course when I do the eighty metre contest, and that's uh, ARI, mm. <laughs> and he he comes quite, through quite strong here to North Wales actually. But uh, uh, I always managed to get him. I always managed to get him. But there we are. But uh, you know, I don't work QRP. My 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 early craft is. Um, running 100 watts, but um, I do remember doing an experiment with Jan, one of our members, where she was talking from her home in Amluk Port, 
which is a very bad place to get to in Anglesey from where I live in Anglesey. And we kept turning the um the the the, the transmitters down. And I remember turning mine down until it was actually showing nothing <laughs> on on the on the on the, the actual dial on the on the helicopter, but you could still hear me. So I, I don't know how much an aircraft ending out when it shows zero, and I, I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's the nearest I've got to QRP. But I, I shall certainly have a go at it, and I've, I've I've done some quite substantial notes here um, of doing it. Uh, you know. So anybody else got any questions? Yeah, Dan, you know where I live. Uh, probably half a mile from John. But the only problem I've got is I've got an S9 noise. So QRP to me is is zero, isn't it? Because I can't hear anything that comes in. I'm lucky to get Europe in here, and never mind anything else. Yeah. I mean, of course, your your transmissions out will, won't be affected by the noise level at your end. You know, so you could be transmitting low power. But you're absolutely right. I, I'm the same. If if you know receiving QRP stations, particularly on the lower bands here. It's just not going to happen. I, I, I really struggle. Um, but uh, I, usually the 100 watt stations will come in OK. But uh, on the higher bands, it's much better. 17 metres and so on is, uh, is pretty clear. I've just seen there's a question popped up on the chat uh, from Wynn. Uh, does membership run for 12 months when you join or is it from a date? Well, it is from the 1st of January every year. So 1st of January is the renewal date. However, um, I... I, I I can make an announcement that as part of our convention, we were doing a special offer. So if you join between now and the 4th of September, you actually get from now till the end of 2022 as your membership. So you get sort of, what's that, 15 months or, or 16 months membership uh, for the price of, uh, of 12. So you'll get the Sprat uh, magazines for the rest of this year and then all, all of next year. And free access to the convention, of course, which uh, is, is worth having. So, uh, but normally, 1st of January is the renewal. Yeah, I'll, um, thanks for that reminder there, Steve, actually, because I haven't renewed for this year. So we'll, we'll ah. do that ready for the convention. It happens. <laughs> I'm like that with every club I'm in, you wait till you fall off the edge and then think, oh, crumbs. Yeah. Um, but no, um, QRP, if you're using FM, I suppose it is. But we, when I lived in Shropshire on my own, little two-story cottage so the bedrooms in the eaves of the cottage and weren't allowed antennas outside so uh, I'd got a, a sleeve di a vertical sleeve dive pod with two meters just for the local lads and at the other end of it a vertical sleeve um, for four just that was just monitoring the FM calling frequency because there was a few of us within five or six miles that used to natter on it and we used to just get in the house, house whatever time of day, just leave it switched on, just monitor, put a few calls out, whatever. But um, lo and behold, I ended up having a 30-minute conversation with an Italian, well, he's on Sicily. <laughs> uh, he was running 250 milliwatts. Yeah. He did up it to a watt in the end because I was struggling. I got his call sign, but like, like Stu was saying, we, we exchanged the basics to, to constitute the QSO, uh -huh. but it was hard work. Yeah. Um, I was running about five watts. But he was running at a watt. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't turn this this old. Um, it was FM one thousand when those Philips XPMR jobs down. Mm -hmm. but, um, it's amazing, especially on the higher bands, um, what you can do when you least expect it with QRP. Absolutely. I say my, my first experience on six meter. Well, not my first experience. I, I had a six meter transverter that I'd built, uh, and I'd had contacts on it uh, when I was up in Cumbria with a guy who lived probably about five miles away and we used to chat uh, and that and it was only 500 milliwatts output this transverter so it was uh, yeah, it was okay but it wasn't any power and then um, I was on the two meters one day and, and a guy from Bristol said have you worked any of the Italians on six meters and I said well I've only got 500 milliwatts I ain't going to work the Italians and he said oh yeah you will so I plugged it in and sure enough the band was full of Italians and I gave a couple of them a call and with 500 milliwatts, I think I worked six or seven, one after the other. It was incredible. Yeah. Uh, with, with the, the quick question, were the Italians working Italian QRP or...? or... Oh, yeah, they only had one kilowatt. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I think we have an M6 here who uses that as well. 
I don't think he knows what QRP is either, but there we are. <laughs> I, I get I, fed up for telling him. Yeah, I have to say, I did, I did meet um, the late George a couple of times at Rishworth. Mm-hmm. And he was running the rally, you know. And he authored a, a little ah, Ladybird book. Yep. Isn't it building a simple crystal set or a transistor radio? I forget exactly now. I've got it somewhere. And um, bless him. I, I had to put a donation in the charity bucket for children in need. I think I put a tenner in, but he did autograph my um, Ladybird book for me, which yeah. is it's, it's still here somewhere. Yeah, it's one of one of my big regrets. I've I've, I've got the Ladybird book, but I, I I knew George pretty well, and I kept thinking yeah. I must take it with me and get him to to autograph it. And uh, uh, of course, I ran out of time because he he passed away sadly. Yeah, uh, George actually sorry. did come to our club if I remember rightly. Do you I remember? Know, sorry. Nice um, do you yeah. remember him coming, Stu? Yeah. Yes, yes, I do remember him coming, I think, twice, actually. Um, yeah. Because yeah, he had he had a, a, a retreat, didn't he, up in, in Snowdonia? Um, yeah, I think he did. It was down by, um, uh, down past, uh, down past Bed Gallet, somewhere like that, I think. Yeah, because he, he was preparing it for sale and he had a, a, a bad fall. I think he broke his leg or his hip and ended up in hospital in... Um, it was in North Wales somewhere, that wherever you, wherever wherever the, uh, the the broken hip specialists are, and Oswestry, probably. No, that'd possibly, be Oswestry, yeah. I should think. Possibly, yeah. yeah. yeah possibly. But, uh, but that was that was the sort of the start of his demise. Really, uh, he, he was he was not too steady on his feet, and uh, he took a tumble and uh, and you know spent some time in hospital. It's uh, and he never really recovered. He, he he was you know other things medically wrong with him, but uh, poor, poor chap. Uh, he went downhill fairly quickly, sadly. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Any mm. more questions? Any more? No. Oh, well. Okay. Well, well, thank you, Steve. That was most interesting. Well, thank you for um, having me. Well, um, well yeah, we, we quite enjoy it. It's the, be- the beauty of it is that we can have you talking on here. But it costs a bloody fortune to get you up to, to Anglesey. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you can 